we make a, make a bit of a tour around the world, moving from the US now to Germany. And we first do Germany because Heinz Wolfgang has to leave a bit earlier. So we move not only to Germany, but we also move from the cure sector to the long-term care sector. And you will talk about that, the changes that are being implemented in Germany at the moment. Thank you. Um, yeah, I hope the presentation will show up uh, in... Ah, just press it. Okay. Ah, <laughs> that's about uh, new technology. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your introduction and uh, also for the chance to talk to you today and being part of this event, even though I have to leave in time because my son has his birthday today and I promise to be home by 8 o'clock. And uh, that's uh, only possible if I take the train a quarter to three. So, uh, but I'm trying to uh, do my part that we don't... Uh, uh, run out of time. So I'm talking about uh, long-term care insurance in Germany and that's the point I want to cover, briefly telling you about uh, the German uh, long-term care insurance system, how it was introduced, why it was introduced, how it works, then uh, going to fiscal development because fiscal, that was uh, my catchword, uh, fiscal sustainability, uh, going to the basic dilemma of long-term care insurances at all, and then in the end telling you something about uh, what's happening in, in Germany and that's a uh, in a way in, uh, interesting and, and also surprising because we are in the middle of a big reform and the whole purpose of the reform seems to be to spend more money. And uh, that's uh, <laughs> something that's not uh, happening uh, that often also in Germany. Let me start with uh, introducing uh, the long-term care insurance. Uh, when, uh, when we talked about uh, long-term care insurance and introduced it in 1994, we were a quarter of a, uh, of a century behind uh, the Netherlands, uh, uh, but nevertheless we were uh, a front runner compared to other countries that came then, uh, like Japan, Korea, Luxembourg, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so uh, when we really started a new round of introducing long-term care insurance systems. What was the reason why it was introduced? Of course, the problems we all think about, demographic change, uh, social structural change, increasing number of dependent people, but, um, what I want to, to, to underline is that in Germany we also had this fiscal policy discourse. That means that the, the complaints were coming from the municipalities saying that via uh, welfare system, via social assistance, the municipalities had to pay for people in long-term care living in nursing homes. And they said we can no longer afford that. And that was the very reason why uh, long-term care insurance was introduced in the middle of the 1990s. Not so much about uh, the, because of the welf welfare state discourse. Of course, uh, in, in uh, public speeches, that was the thing that was highlighted. We have to do something for the old people, etc. But I think the fiscal uh, argument was at the very bottom of the uh, introduction of this system. And you could also see that uh, when you see or how the system was introduced. Um, it was introduced uh, on one hand accompanied by cuts in other welfare systems so that all in all uh, it should not be more expensive. And then also if, if you look into the regulation of the system, you see uh, that there were a, a number of provisions that should prevent any cost explosion. Uh, starting with the tight definition of dependency, uh, a very strict definition which particularly neglected uh, um, uh, dementia and, and, and other uh, uh, cognitive impairments uh, to a considerable amount, uh, which meant uh, once we have introduced that, we, all, we, we, we even started uh, discussing is this definition really a good idea? And uh, since 2006, we had expert commissions three by now, and we now next year uh, we'll see a reform where this tight definition is broadened up. So that, that comes uh, from the very beginning. Uh, it was introduced as an instrument to contain costs, but uh, it proved to be uh, not a, a good idea. We also had capped benefits, which were nominally fixed, other than in health insurance, where you have the entitlement to get everything that's needed. In long-term care, you only have entitlement for so-and-so uh, much money, and then it stops. So uh, that was uh, the way it was introduced uh, as a kind of compromise also within the political parties uh, to form the government at that time. And um, so the result was uh, a system um, 
with uh, a mandatory insurance for everyone, which was new at that time in Germany, uh, in the middle of the 1990s, not everyone was uh, forced to have health insurance. That was, for about 10% of the population, it was uh, not mandatory, but it was their free choice to have it. But long-term care was the first system where there was mandatory insurance for the whole population. Nevertheless, in two branches, uh, about almost 90% of the population in social long-term care insurance, but 10%, more than 10% in private mandatory long-term care insurance. And if you read about that, uh, those uh, 10 or 13 percent are often neglected, and, and uh, the impression is created that everyone is in the social long-term care insurance, which is not completely true. Nevertheless, I will talk most of the time about social long-term care insurance, uh, which is financed as a, in a pay-as-you-go system, contributions levied on income from wages and salaries, uh, so everything we also know from social health uh, insurance. Uh, the entitlement is according to the abilities of daily living, whether you can perform them uh, or not, and to which amount. And then there's the medical service of the, the funds that's doing the assessment. So that's also important in, in, in health. The doctors decide what you need. Here, it's the medical service of the sickness funds who decide what you need. Another provision for cost containment. We have uh, different kind of benefits, cash benefits, in-kind benefits, benefits for nursing homes, and all these benefits are capped, uh, and the, the caps are below what is really needed. So there, right from the beginning, there is a considerable amount of co-payment built, in, uh, built into the system. Uh, in nursing homes, it's uh, becoming uh, uh, transparent because uh, only uh, benefits are only for the care cost, but uh, nothing for room and board and nothing for the capital cost of building uh, a nursing home. And even for the care cost, the cap benefits are not sufficient to cover them completely. And uh, so that's a, a kind of overview, what is banned on long-term care. And if, you, if we start uh, at, at uh, the bottom line, we see at the moment we spend 45 billion euro, uh, which is quite uh, quite a lot, quite some, some money. Uh, but uh, if you then uh, look uh, who, what are the sources of financing, you see that uh, about uh, one third, almost one third, comes out of pocket. And only 62.8% coming from public funds. And uh, long-term care insurance, the social long-term care insurance, only covers about half of the, the overall uh, expenses. Uh, so you also have to keep that in mind. We're talking about social long-term care insurance all the time, <laughs> but it's covering only parts of the bills. Uh, if we check what's happened in the social long-term care insurance, you can see here in this graph the columns represent the yearly surplus of the system, and the surplus only occurred in the introductory phase. Uh, when uh, contributions were paid quite from the beginning, uh, benefits were only introduced uh, with a delay of a couple of months, and then it needed some time until everyone realizes what the entitlements were. So we had surpluses in the beginning, but then they disappeared. We had a period where we uh, had just a zero, uh, and then uh, the period of fiscal problems uh, arised. And, and you can see here we had deficits that were ever increasing, and then we started some ad hoc fixes. Uh, for example, at the end of 2004, uh, we introduced an extra contribution for the childless. So that's why in, in 2005, the deficit was lower than uh, it would have been otherwise. Uh, it didn't uh, suffice, so then in 2006, uh, we um, changed uh, the, the time when the contribution has to be paid from the end of the month to the beginning of the month, which means that was the year with 13 months. Uh, so we had 13 monthly contributions, uh, which you can't do on a permanent basis. So uh, that's only uh, one year. And after that, once again, we were in deficit. And so we entered uh, the period then in 2008 where we have uh, real structural reforms, and we had reforms 2008, 2013, 2015, 2017. So in ever shorter periods, uh, ever uh, more fundamental reforms. And uh, I've tried to indicate that we have uh, a rise in contribution rate four times in this period. And uh, also, we had, for the first time, we had adjustments of benefits. So here in this area, uh, uh, then, so the, the story is different. We uh, we managed to maintain the contribution rate for 
quite a while. You can see that here the blue column set the contribution rate, 1.7% uh, of uh, uh, income, and, and we, we kept it constant to the middle of 2008. And in this period, fiscal sustainability was a priority. Uh, and then we, we left that. And uh, after that, you see the contribution rate has gone up uh, in, in, in several steps. And uh, this uh, points to the basic dilemma of long-term care insurance uh, and uh, of a social long-term care insurance in particular. Uh, on the expenditure side, we have, uh, due to demographic change, uh, uh, the increasing number of dependent people, even if we uh, keep entitlement constant. And uh, you see at the moment we have 2.7 million people entitled to benefits from the long-term care insurance system. And this number will go up to 4.6% uh, by uh, 2050 if the entitlement is kept constant. As I will explain later, the entitlement will be broadened, so the number will uh, then be higher. Um, uh, so that's a, a consequence of demographic change, and we cannot do anything about that. So then uh, second is we have to uh, shift from informal caregiving uh, to formal caregiving. That's a trend we can see in the last a couple of years, and uh, there are good reasons to assume that that will uh, go on for demographic reasons, for social demographic reasons, for, for, for all kinds of, of reasons. Uh, third, we have a North shirt shortage at the moment, which will increase dramatically in the next couple of years, which means wages are expected to uh, increase even more than uh, in, in other uh, branches, in other industries. So on the contributory side, on the other hand, the only positive thing we have is that we, of course, uh, assume that wages will uh, go on, go, go up, but the number of people in gainful employment in the long or in middle term and in, in the long run uh, <laughs> will rather decline. We expect a decline in the number of working people by 2030 uh, of 15%, by 2050 of 25%. So just the, the, the number of people around in working age uh, will decline. So what can you do? You have on, on, a, on a positive side, on a contributory side, only the wage increases. And you can use that either to adjust benefits. Benefits are for nursing care. Nursing care costs depend on, on, on wages of nurses. So, so if you use all the extra income on that, all the extra income is spent, and the number of the increasing number of, of, of dependents uh, um, is not uh, taken care for. So that means the contribution rate will go up. Or you use it the other way around. You say the increases in wages are used to finance the increasing number of uh, of dependent people, but then the amount of benefits is going in real terms is going down. And uh, what we can see uh, from 1994 to 2008. Uh, we have chosen the latter one. Benefits um, uh, um, have what's the uh, benefits have not been uh, have been con kept constant in nominal terms, right? Which means in re in real terms they have declined all the time. We managed to keep a constant contribution rate, but uh, uh, at the end of this period, the the benefits you got from the insurance were twenty percent less. The value was 20% less than it was from, from the beginning. And that stopped in 2008. Since then, we have tried to, to come to terms with the real purchasing power. But the problem, as you have seen, is, of course, that the contribution rate has been gone up all the time. And to give you an impression of what I'm talking about, here are the figures for nursing home care. You see on the, uh, the left-hand side, that's the, the daily rates for care, for room and board, for investment, the total of the daily rate. And then you see what the uh, uh, benefits are of the insurance here. And you see the rest that has to be covered out of pocket. You see, if we look at the whole rate, more than half of it has to be paid out of pocket. Uh, even if we look on the care costs, and that was the original promise, that the care costs should be more or less be covered by the long-term care insurance, you see that 400, 600, or 800 euros per month that has to be paid out of pocket. And um, yeah, as I said, uh, only 2008 we had the first adjustment, and now 2015 we had another round of adjustment. And so that's what happened with these uh, private co-payments, this out-of-pocket payment. You see over time how it 
increased uh, uh, for 2015. Uh, that's just an estimate because the figures are not there. And, and uh, so my uh, reading of this dilemma is uh, we started with keeping contribution rate constant, but f at the cost of uh, reducing real benefits. That worked for some time because people were happy that there was something that hasn't been there before. But now uh, we realize we can't do that anymore, which means we are facing uh, increasing cost and increasing contribution rates. So what can be done can be done about that. And one solution that was discussed in the last term of the last government, uh, and also to some extent in this term, this, this government, is uh, funding, introducing funded systems. And uh, 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 we had two mechanisms for that uh, in, uh, with the uh, uh, Christian Democrats and liberal government. We introduced a private scheme, private supplementary uh, long-term care insurance scheme. And uh, uh, in, in the term of this government, as a Christian Democrat, social democratic government, we introduced a collective uh, provident fund with, within the social long-term care insurance. So just to give you a brief impression uh, of this thing we call Pflegebar, because the minister at that time was called uh, Bar, and Pflege, that's the, the, the German word for care. Uh, so what is the, 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 the Pflegebar? It's a tax subsidy of five euro per month. You know, five euro per month, that's not a lot. Uh, now, if there are certain uh, um, conditions fulfilled, and um, particularly important, no medical underwriting, uh, insurance companies are not allowed to di di dis distinguish uh, according to risk with their premium. Yeah, I, I said even in, 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 a, in the heading that uh, attempt uh, was a failure. And uh, to give you just one uh, argument, uh, it's uh, uh, nobody buys these kind of insurances. Uh, the government in 2013 had provision for uh, subsi subs subsiding uh, one and a half million contracts. By now, we still stand at about half a million contracts. So uh, nobody buys this thing, and uh, nobody buys it for good reason, because those of you uh, <coughs> who are familiar with uh, insurance uh, economics uh, might have realized that the prototype of, of adverse selection. You offer something with uh, um, uh, uh, insurance, you don't know who uh, is buying that, the good risk or the bad risk. You have asymmetric information. You <laughs> are not allowed to risk differentiate, which means uh, the good risk will not take it up. The bad risk will, will do it. The calculation does not fit, and uh, so it will all end in disaster. And the interesting thing about that is since there is five years until the first benefits are paid, that means only in 2018 the first cases will occur, we don't know how much these tariffs do not uh, uh, fit to the real risk structure of the of the collectivity of the collective, which means in 2018, 19, 20, we will realize for the first time that this uh, 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 is not calculated properly, and then insurance companies are allowed to raise to, to raise premiums, and then of course we have captive consumers who have paid for for some time uh, into the system and can either drop out and all their payment is gone or they accept. Uh, increases in premiums. And um, that's why virtually no one from the consumer uh, advisory board uh, uh, really supports this, uh, uh, this product. Yeah. Uh, it has also some other problems which I just skip. Uh, the other thing is the provision of the Pflegevorsorge form. That's the uh, collective uh, uh, funded system introduced in 2013. Uh, which means that every year at the moment 1.2 billion euro is put aside into a fund that uh, therefore for, should collect uh, capital for 20 years and from 2035 onwards 5% per year should be spent which means 20 years later on the fund is, uh, is empty. That's the uh, idea and it was uh, hailed as a very innovative thing. Uh, uh, I think... Uh, it's not a solution. Uh, on the one hand, the effect is very small. I can uh, show you here some projection from a colleague. You see uh, the, uh, the, the, the dark lines. That's the development of the contribution rate. If there is nothing, 
and you see those light lines here, that's the difference uh, due to the, uh, uh, this uh, Pflegevorsorge form. You see uh, it really changes nothing. Uh, and it's the second point, it's difficult to protect any such fund against politicians. I'm not aware of any uh, historical example where it was possible to put some money aside keep it there for decades for a purpose. Because there's always the next crisis looming around the corner and then you need the money. And you can even see that uh, uh, today because uh, uh, in, in the new reform, uh, we don't touch this money, but we reduce the liquidity, which you had, could have seen on the slides before, by several millions, exactly the same amount that we built up in, in, the, in the Pflege Vorsorge reform. So uh, if you put both together, there is no uh, capi uh, capital uh, that is, is collected. Yeah. Uh, third one, of course, the, the fund is empty when we have the highest numbers of, of, of uh, people uh, in need of long-term care. And uh, uh, when we need it most, it's gone already. So uh, I think uh, these uh, funding options, we have tried them privately, collectively. I don't think they are any good. So now let's come to, to, to the recent reform, and as I mentioned before, that's somehow uh, uh, puzzling. Uh, uh, the original definition of entitlement was very strict. We know that it's not, not good, and as a result, we have a new definition that's, that's already part of the law, but uh, it's only used for the assessment from January next year onwards. And um, I didn't translate that. Uh, that's the, the modules uh, for, for the new uh, assessment system, and what you can see, those are the old ones. Uh, that is uh, mobility and that's uh, ADL, uh, activity of daily livings. And that's now 50% of the new assessment. And the rest here, these 30% uh, are new. It's cognition, uh, um, uh, cognitive impairments, that's uh, uh, challenging behavior, uh, that's uh, dealing with uh, uh, sickness and, and, and uh, the, the necessities of the healthcare system, and that's uh, particular social context and uh, um, participation in society. So that's, that's a quite a different uh, idea of what uh, long-term care should be about. Not just feeding the, the people, but making sure uh, that they are still part of the society, that they can participate in social life. That's the idea of the, the new uh, assessment. And uh, as I said, this reform is remarkable generous and also remarkable expensive. And uh, if you look into the process, the interesting thing is in the last weeks before the, 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 the bill was passed, um, the ministry changed several things and all in the same direction to make it more generous and more expensive. Um, and as a consequence, uh, um, now 95% of those in home care will receive higher benefits when the re once the reform is uh, in, in place and 5% for those nothing changes. Uh, in the nursing home care, it's about one third who, who has to pay less then, and for the, uh, for the rest, nothing changes. Because uh, there is a provision, if you would have to pay more, then the difference is covered by uh, the, uh, the long-term care fund. So virtually, be, virtually no one is getting worse off after reform, but uh, uh, numerous, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, many people are much better off. Uh, to finance this reform, the contribution rate goes up all in all, it's three reform steps, all in all by uh, 0.5 percentage point, that is uh, an expenditure of six to seven uh, billion euro, or it's about one quarter of what we now spend. So uh, if you would imagine that for a healthcare system or a pension system, uh, a rise in expenditure by 25 percent, uh, you would say it's not possible, but uh, that's what's happening at the moment. So uh, that's why I think it's really remarkable uh, to have uh, such a reform. And interestingly, uh, it's not meeting any resistance, not even from the employers' association. So um, uh, even during implementation now, some costly decisions have been made, and the only debate is whether it's sufficient or whether should, we should spend even more. So that's, uh, in a way, it's a real puzzle. In an area, uh, in, in a time of permanent austerity, uh, austerity, where up to now in social policy we have always discussed about cost containment, we have a reform here where the policymakers 
just spend money as if there was no tomorrow. So um, <laughs> while for one and a half decade contribution rate was kept constant at the cost of decreasing purchasing power, now a rising contribution rate is accepted for now. You may have uh, noticed I'm a bit skeptical about the long-term uh, <laughs> uh, effects. Yeah. So conclusion, uh, what can we learn from that? Uh, I think I haven't talked too much about that, but uh, I think uh, social insurance is a good solution for financing long-term care insurance because it's able to react flexible. Uh, it's not like a funded system where you have to plan 50 years in advance, which you can't. And uh, so I'm, I'm still uh, quite a, a fan of a social insurance system. Uh, if I had to advise any other country, I would say uh, avoid some of the mistakes we have done in Germany. That is, uh, uh, make sure that you have the whole population in the system, not just 90%. And particularly, make sure that those 10% who opt out are not the, uh, the, the better risk and the, the richer parts of the society, as we have. Uh, make, it, uh, make all kind of in income contributory, not just uh, uh, income from gainful uh, uh, employment, because... Uh, uh, particular in income from capital might rise faster. Um, uh, so there are some technical fixes, but all in all, I'm still a fan of social insurance system. Additional funded systems do not contribute contribute sustainable, uh, to sustainable financing. I, I, I think the German example shows that, uh, but I'm also not aware of any other uh, uh, positive uh, example where uh, additional funded systems really work. Uh, we see then this uh, dilemma, rising expenditure can be controlled for a while by not adjusted cap benefits to inflation, but this solution is not sustainable. And in an aging society, therefore, we must uh, just accept that expenditure, particular for long-term care, will go up, and there is no way out of that unless we... Uh, uh, put those people in independency into misery. So if we don't want that, uh, we have to finance that. And the only question is how to do that. Who is financing it? Who is bearing the, 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 uh, the burden? Uh, how is it distributed uh, according to different income strata, etc.? But there is no way uh, to, to stop these uh, uh, costs. And, and also, we have heard a lot of technology before for the healthcare system. I think the long-term care system, particular if you have an idea of long-term care as people also being able to communicate with each other, to being part of society, there is no technology fix to that. There's a personal uh, uh, care that, that, that needs people who do that, and that will always cost money. So last point in Germany at at least at the moment, you might, you might increase expenditure without being punished by the electorate. That's an amazing experience, but uh, I'm not sure how long that will last. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>He's not in it because it's a social ins insurance scheme and he has no money in that. Okay. Mm. And he is not, uh, not critical on the increasing of the contribution rates, the, the tax increases. Mm. It's not no tax, it, it's social uh, contribution. But so he, technically he's not involved. Okay. Uh, of course you can say if social insurance contributions uh, increase, it's more difficult for him to increase taxes. Yeah, yeah so there, there is this kind of connection. But he's not at the center of the, de of the debate. And normally it would be the employers who would, would uh, try to stop that because uh, we have a parity in finance in this. Mm. But uh, the, the climate uh, at the moment is so that even employers, as long as long-term care is concerned, uh, they are not too outspoken because uh, it, it's, uh, there's a huge potential to scandalize that if you say there are old people who don't get enough uh, care and um, you rather can, can heckle about some, some medical technology. Okay, this is very visible, huh? this yeah. area, long-term care.
Questions from the audience, please. Yes. Well, I have two small questions and a comment. Uh, the, question, the small questions are, um, how do people on low income manage to pay for the difference between the benefits and the costs? Uh, are the municipalities uh, stepping in again? Um, my second question is, um, can you say a little bit more about this uh, expected shortage of nurses? How do you explain for that? And finally, my comment is that uh, <coughs> when I listened to your presentation, I believe that the Dutch healthcare system, a Dutch long system for long-term care, and the German system are in a completely different mode. Um, if I would like, if I would use two words, I would say you have the policy of uh, contraction, that's the Netherlands, uh, and Germany, that's the politics of extension. And that's interesting to see two countries, neighbors, in a totally different mode as far as long-term care is concerned. Same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Starting with, with the letter, with, with the comment, uh, uh, I agree, though it's a snapshot uh, at, at this very moment. And if you think about what's your contribution rate with your long-term care insurance, which of course covers different things, and, and think our uh, contribution rate is at two percentage points, uh, and in, in, in health we have 15, 16 percentage points. So it's, it's still the, the small system. That's why it's easier to to increase here, and I think that, that the different expenditure structure might account for the different modes which are, as you, you said. Uh, with how can people afford uh, that? Uh, you're right, some people can't afford that. And about 30% of those in nursing homes receive social assistance, which is a means-tested welfare system. And that's uh, what you find here, social assistance, uh, it's uh, spending three point something billion euro um, on long-term care. And uh, uh, you're also right, that has to be uh, carried by the municipalities, which are always critical, uh, and which always have been critical uh, due to, 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 to the decreasing purchasing power of, of the long-term care and insurance benefits, because they know uh, at the end of the day, they might have to step in. And, and so uh, that's it's not only that we do not have any, uh, uh, any actor at the moment who is trying to stop expansion, but we have here we have one actor who is always trying to, 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 to uh, lobby in favor of uh, expansion of long-term care insurance. That's the municipalities. Um, what was the meaning? Nurses. 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 Uh, nurses. Um, nurses um, well, just giving a, a few figures, uh, I, I think the, the number of people in, in need of long-term care will ri rise by about 70% over the next uh, decade. If we uh, uh, take uh, into account that the family's cap capabilities of caring might decline, we end up with about, we need 80% more, right? 80% more nurses. Uh, then we have uh, uh, a working force that's declining by 20 to 30 percent till 2050. If I combine these figures, I know that I need more than double the share of the working populations working in long-term care. And doubling this share is difficult, particularly in a labor market, which uh, is no longer uh, characterized by unemployment in the future, but by uh, a lack of, of, of employees. That means nurses, uh, or those who want to employ nurses, have to compete with uh, with insurance companies, with uh, banking uh, companies, with uh, administration, with, with all kinds of industries which have better pay, better working conditions, and so on. And so you can make projections. We do that uh, f f from now and then. Uh, the, the last one we did actually last week, and saying by 2030 we need about 400,000 full-time equivalents additional if we want to maintain the a carer to, to caregiver, uh, caregiver to, to care for relations we have at the moment. No improvements in quality, but just to, to uh, uh, maintain this relation. So it's a story of fiscal surpluses and labor market shortages. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's quite a challenge for the German system. Mm -hmm. uh, I take up a final question on this presentation before moving forward. Yep. Martin. You made a statement that you would like to reduce informal care in Germany. In the Netherlands, we try to improve informal care. 
No. Uh, is so there some reason why you won't promote informal care in Germany? No, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, then uh, I got it cr uh, wrongly uh, uh, across. I'm not uh, saying that anyone wants to uh, to to, to um, decrease informal care. Uh, and it was just a statement about what we expect. At the moment, 50% of the, the people in need of long-term care are cared for by families alone, without any professional, any formal caregiver being involved, 50%. It was 60% when we started the long-term care insurance. And there is good reason why we can expect that it's declining, because just the number of potential caregivers for per, per dependent people goes down dramatically. The number of people with no kids is going up. The number of children per se is going down. The re regional mobility is going up. The women's labor market participation has been gone up. And uh, we know at the moment women take the, 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 the lion's share of the burden. And uh, that means sometimes they drop out, uh, out of the labor market. The better educated they are, the better jobs they have the higher are the opportunity costs for that. So, so there are all kinds of reasons to suspect that it's going down. We don't want it, and we do a lot to, to prevent that. Yeah? And, and we have also have a policy uh, about uh, combining gainful employment and caregiving, and how, how can, this can be done, and what kind of support do families need, counseling, case management. Well, that's all there, but nevertheless, I don't think that we will sustain the high share of family caregiving alone. Okay, thank you very much. I think you are, we in the Netherlands are moving from, from a high level position and, and you are moving from a low level expenditure position. So somewhere we might meet each other <laughs> <laughs> in the future. Um, uh, thank you very much. We move to the next uh, session. Which is